Chapter One of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part Two War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part Two War by Charles Farrar Brown. Chapter One The Show is Confiscated. You have perhaps wondered whereabouts I was for these many days gone and past. Uh, perchance you supposed I'd gone to the tomb of the Capulets, though I don't know what those is. It's a popular newspaper phrase. Listen to my tale, and be silent that ye may hear I've been among the secessors, earning my daily peck by my legitimate profession, and haven't had no time to wield my facile quill for the great comic paper if you'll allow me to quote from your truthful advertisement. My success was scaly, and I likewise had a narrow escape of my life. If what I've been through is southern hospitality, about which you've heard so much, then I feel bound to observe that they made too much of me. They was altogether too lavish with their attentions. I went among the secessors with no feelings of animosity, I went in my professional capacity. I was actuated by one of the most loftiest desires that can swell the human bosom, viz., to give the people their money's worth by showing them sagacious beasts and wax statutes, which I venture to say are unsurpassed by any other statutes anywheres. I will not call that man who says my statutes is humbug a liar and a horse thief but bring him before me and I'll wither him with one of my scornful frowns. But to proceed with my tale. In my travels through the sunny south I heard a heap of talk about secession and busting up the Union, but I didn't think it amounted to nothing. The politicians in all the villages was swearing that old Abe, sometimes called the Prairie Flower, should not never be inaugurated. Well, they also made fools of themselves in various ways, but as they was used to that, I didn't let it worry me much, and the stars and stripes continued for to wave over my little tent. Moreover, I was a son of Malty, and a member of several other temperance societies, and my wife, she was a daughter of Malty, and I supposed those facts would secure me the influence and protection of all the first families. Alas, I was dispinted. State outer state, she seshed, and it growed hotter and hotter for the undersigned. Things came to a climax in, in small town in Alabama, where I was peremptorily ordered to haul down the stars and stripes. A deputation of red-faced men come up to the door of my tent where I was standing taking money. The afternoon exhibition had commenced, and my Italian organist was jerking his soul-stirring chimes. We air come, sir, said a military man in a cocked hat, upon a high and holy mission. The southern eagle is screaming throughout this sunny land, proudly and defiantly screaming, sir. What's the matter with him, says I? Don't his vittles sit well on his stomach? Well, that eagle, sir, will continue to scream all over this bright and tremendous land. Well, let him scream. If your eagle can amuse himself by screaming, let him went. The men annoyed me, for I was busy making change. We are come, sir, upon a matter of duty. Oh, you're right, Captain. It's every man's duty to visit my show, said I. We are come, and that's the reason you are here, says I, laughing one of my silvery laughs. I thought if he wanted to go, I'd give him some of my sparkling epigrams. Sir, you're insolent. The plain question is, will you haul down the star-spangled banner and heist the southern flag? Nary hist. Those was my reply. Your waxworks and beasts is then confiscated, and you are arrested as a spy. Says I, my fragrant roses of the southern clime and blooming daffodils, what's the price of whiskey in this town and how many cubic feet of that seductive fluid can you individually hold they made no reply to that but said my wax figures was confiscated i asked them if that was generally the style among thieves in that country 
to which they also made no reply, but said I was arrested as a spy, and must go to Montgomery in arms. Well, they was by this time joined by a large crowd of other southern patriots, who commenced hollering, hang the bald-headed abolitionist, and bust up his immoral exhibition. I was seized and tied to a stump, and the crowd went from my tent, that waterproof pavilion wherein instruction and amusement had been so muchly combined at fifteen cents per head, and tore it all to pieces. Meanwhile, dirty-faced boys was throwing stones and empty beer bottles at my massive brow, and taking other improper liberties with my person. Resistance was useless, for a variety of reasons, as I readily observed. The secessors confiscated my statutes by smashing them to atoms. They then went to my money box and confiscated all the loose change therein contained. They then went and busted my cages, letting all the animals loose, a small but healthy tiger among the rest. Now, this tiger has an eccentric way of tearing dogs to pieces, and I always supposed from his general conduct that he'd have no hesitation in serving human beings in the same way if he could get at them. Excuse me if I was cruel, but I larfed boisterously when I see that tiger spring in among the people. Go it, my sweet cuss, I inwardly exclaimed. I forgive you for biting off my left thumb with all my heart. Rip him up like a bully tiger whose lair has been invaded by secessors. Well, I, I can't say for certain that the tiger seriously injured any of them, but he was seen a few days after, some miles distant, with a large and well-selected assortment of seats of trousers in his mouth, and as he looked as though he'd been having some violent exercise, I rather guess he did. You will therefore perceive that they didn't confiscate him very much. I was carried to Montgomery in Irons, and placed in Duran's vial. The jail was an ordinary edifice, but the table was liberally supplied with bacon and cabbage. Well, this was a good variety, for when I didn't hanker after bacon, I could help myself to the cabbage. I had nobody to talk to, nor nothing to talk about, howsoever, and I was very lonely, especially on the first day. So when the jailer parsed my lonely cell, I put the few stray hairs on the back part of my head, I'm bald now, but there was a time when I wore sweet auburn ringlets into a disheveled estate as possible, and rolling my eyes like a maniac, I cried, Stay, jailer, stay! I am not mad, but soon shall be if you don't bring me something to talk. He brung me some newspapers, for which I thanked him kindly. At last I got an interview with Jefferson Davis, the president of the Southern Confederacy. He was very polite, and asked me to sit down and state my case. I did it, and then he laughed and said his gallant man had been a little too enthusiastic in confiscating my show. Yes, says I, they confiscated me too muchly. I had some hosses confiscated in the same way once, but the confiscators are now pounding stone in the state's prison in Indianapolis. Well, well, Mr. Ward, you are at liberty to depart. You are friendly to the South, I know. Even now we have many friends in the North who sympathize with us and won't mingle with this fight. J. Davis, there's your great mistake. Many of us was your sincere friends, and thought certain parties among us was fussing about you and meddling with your concerns entirely too much. But, J. Davis, the minute you fire a gun at the piece of dry goods called the Star-Spangled Banner, the North gets up and rises en masse in defense of that banner. Not again you as individuals, not again the South even, but to save the flag. We should indeed be weak in the knees, unsound in the heart, milk white in the liver, and soft in the head, if we stood quietly by and saw this glorious government smashed to pieces either by a furrin or an intestine foe. The gentle-hearted mother hates to take her naughty child across her knee, but she knows it is her duty to do it. So we shall hate to whip the naughty South, but we must do it if you don't make back tracks at once, and we shall wallop you out of your boots. J. Davis, it is my decided opinion that the sunny South is making an egregious muttonhead of herself. 
Go on, sir, you're safe enough. You're too small powder for me, said the president of the Southern Confederacy. Wait till I go home and start out the Bladensville Mounted Hoss Cavalry. I'm captain of that corpse, I am. And J. Davis, beware. Jefferson D., I now leave you. Farewell, my gay sailor boy. Goodbye, my bold buccaneer, pirate of the deep blue sea. Adieu, adieu. My tour through the Southern Confederacy on my way home was thrilling enough for yeller covers. It will form the subject of my next. Betsy Jane and the progeny, air well. Yours respectively, A. Ward. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part Two War by Charles Ferrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Thrilling Scenes in Dixie. I had a narrow escape from the sunny south. The swings and errors of outrageous fortune alluded to by Hamlick weren't nothing in comparison to my troubles. I come pesky near swearing some profane oaths more'n once. But I hope I didn't do it, for I promised she whose name shall be nameless, except that her initials is Betsy J., that I'll join the meeting house at Bladensville just as soon as I can scrape money enough together so I can afford to be pious in good style like my wealthy neighbors. But if I'm confiscated again, I'm afraid I shall continue on my present benighted state for some time. I figured conspicuously in many thrilling scenes in my tower from Montgomery to my homestead, and on several occasions I thought the great comic paper wouldn't be enriched no more with my lubrications. After bidding adieu to Jefferson D., I started for the depot. I saw a nigger sitting on a fence playing on a banjo. My African brother, said I, quoting from a track I once read, you belong to a very interesting race. Your masters is going to war exclusively on your account. Yes, boss, he replied, and I wish him honorable graves. And he went on playing the banjo, laughing all over and opening his mouth wide enough to drive in an old-fashioned two-wheel chase. The train of cars in which I was to trust my valuable life was the scaliest, ricketiest-looking lot of concerns that I ever saw on wheels afore. "'What time does this string of second-hand coffins leave?' I inquired of the depot master. He said directly, and I went in and sat down. I hadn't more than fairly squatted for a dark-looking man with a swinister expression into his countenance entered the cars, and looking very sharp at me, he asked, "'What was my principles?' "'See, sesh I answered. I'm a dissoluter. I'm in favor of Jeff Davis, Beauregard, Pickens, Captain Kidd, Bluebeard, Monroe Edwards, the Devil, Mrs. Cunningham, and all the rest of them. You're in favor of the war? Why, certainly. By all means. I'm in favor of this war and also of the next war. I've been in favor of the next war for over sixteen years. War to the knife, said the man. Blood, ergo, blood, said I though them words isn't original with me. Them words was writ by Shakespeare, who is dead. His mantle fell onto the author of The Seven Sisters, who was going to have a spring overcoat made out of it. We got under way at last, and uh, proceeded on our journey at about the rate of speed which is generally observed by properly conducted funeral processions. A handsome young gal, with a red musketeer bar on the back of her head and a sassy little black hat tipped over her forehead, sat in the seat with me. She wore a little sesesh flag pinned under her hat, and she was a-going for to see her true love who had joined the Southern Army, all so bold and gay. So she told me. She was chilly, and I offered her my blanket. Father living? I asked. Yes, sir. Got any uncles? A heap. Uncle Thomas is dead, though. Well, peace to Uncle Thomas's ashes and success to him. I will be your Uncle Thomas. Lean on me, my pretty secesher, and linger in blissful repose. She slept as securely as in her own housing, and didn't disturb the solemn stillness of the night with every snore. 
at the first station a troop of soldiers entered the cars and inquired if old waxworks was on board well this was the disrespective style in which they referred to me because if old waxworks is on board says a man with a face like a double-breasted lobster we're going to hang old waxworks my illustrious and patriotic bummers says i a getting up and taking off my chapeau if you allude to a ward it's my pleasing duty to inform you that he's dead he saw the error of his ways at fifteen minutes past two yesterday and stabbed himself with a stuffed sled stake dying in five beautiful tableaus to slow music his last words was my professional career is over i jerk no more and who be you i'm a student in senator benjamin's law office i'm going up north to steal some spoons and things for the southern army well, this was satisfactory and the intoxicated troopers went off at the next station the pretty little secesher awoke and said she must get out there i bid her a kind adieu and give her some provisions accept my blessing and this hunk of gingerbread i said she thanked me muchly and tripped gaily away there's considerable human nature in a man and i'm afraid i shall always give aid and comfort to the enemy if he comes to me in the shape of a nice young gal at the next station i didn't get off so easy i was dragged out of the cars and rolled in the mud for several minutes for the purpose of taking the conceit out of me as a secesher kindly stated i was led up finally when a powerful large secesher came up and embraced me and to show that he had no hard feelings agin me put his nose into my mouth i returned the compliment by placing my stomach suddenly agin his right foot when he kindly made a spittoon of his able-bodied face actuated by a desire to see whether the secessioner had been vaccinated i then fastened my teeth on to his left coat sleeve and tore it to the shoulder we then violently bunted our heads together for a few minutes danced around a little and sat down in a mud puddle we rose to our feet again and by a sudden and adroit movement i placed my left eye against the secesher's fist we then rushed into each other's arms and fell under a two-horse wagon i was very much exhausted and didn't care about getting up again but the man said he reckoned i'd better and i concluded i would he pulled me up but i hadn't been on my feet more than two seconds before the ground flew up and hit me in the head the crowd said it was high old sport but i couldn't exactly see where the laughter came in i riz and we embraced again we careered madly to a steep bank where i got the upper hands of my antagonist and threw him into the ravine he fell about forty feet striking a grindstone pretty hard i understand he was injured I haven't heard from the grindstone. A man in a cocked hat come up and said he felt as though a apology was due me. There was a mistake. The crowd had taken me for another man. I told him not to mention it, and asked him if his wife and little ones was so as to be about, and got on board the train, which had stopped at that station twenty minutes for refreshments. I got all I wanted. It was the heartiest meal I ever ate. I was rid on a rail the next day, a bunch of blazing firecrackers being tied to my coat tails. It was a fine spectacle in a dramatic point of view, but I didn't enjoy it. I had other adventures of a startling kind, but why continue? Why lacerate the public bosom with these here things? Suffice it to say, I got across Mason and Dixie's line safe at last. I made tracks for my homestead but she to whom I'm harnessed for life failed to recognize in the emaciated being who stood before her the gushing youth of forty-six summers who had left her only a few months before. But I went into the pantry and brought out a certain black bottle. Raising it to my lips, I said, Here's to you, old gal. I did it so natural that she knowed me at once. Those form, them voice, that natural style of doing things, tis he, she cried, and rushed into my arms i was too much for her and she fell into a swoon i come very near swooned in myself no more today from yours for the perpetuation of the union and the bringing of the goddess of liberty out of her present bad fix
End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part Two War by Charles Farrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, Fourth of July Oration. Delivered July Fourth at Weathersfield, Connecticut, eighteen fifty nine. I delivered the following about uh, two years ago to a large and discriminating audience. I was ninety-six minutes passing a given pint. I have revised the oration and added some things which makes it appropriate to the times than it otherwise would be. I have also uh, corrected the grammars and punctuated it. I do my own punctuating nowadays. The printers in Vanity Fair office can't punctuate worth a cent. Fellow citizens, I have been honored with an invite to no rate right before you today, and when I say that I scarcely feel equal to the task, I'm sure you will believe me. Weathersfield is justly celebrated for her onions and patriotism the world over, and to be asked to pause and address you on this my first professional tour through New England causes me to feel, uh, to feel, uh, I may say it causes me to feel great applause they thought this was one of my eccentricities while the fact is i was stuck this is between you and i i am a plain man i don't know nothing about no dead languages and am a little shaky on living ones therefore expect no flowery talk from me what i shall say will be to the pint right straight out i'm not a politician and my other habits are good I've no enemies to reward, no friends to sponge, but I'm a union man. I love the union. It is a big thing, and it makes my heart bleed to see a lot of ornery people a-moving heaven, no, not heaven, but the other place, and earth to bust it up. Too much good blood was split in courting and marrying that highly respectable female, the goddess of liberty, to get a divorce from her now. My own state of Indiana is celebrated for unhitching married people with neatness and dispatch, but you can't get a divorce from the goddess up there. Not by no means. That old gal has behaved herself too well to cast her off now. I'm sorry the pictures don't give her no shoes or stockings, but uh, the band of stars upon her head must continue to shine undimmed forever. I'm for the union as she air and withered be the arm of every ornery cuss who attempts to bust her up. That's me. I have said. It was a very sweaty day, and at this pint of the oration a man fell down with sunstroke. I told the audience that, considering the large number of putty gals present, I was more afraid of a daughter stroke. This was impromptu and seemed to amuse them very much. Feller citizens, I ain't got time to notice the growth of America from the time when the Mayflowers come over in the Pilgrim and brought Plymouth Rock with them, but every schoolboy knows our career has been tremendous. You will excuse me if I don't praise the early settlers of the colonies, people which hung idiotic old women for witches, burn holes in Quakers' tongues, and consign their feller critters to the treadmill and pillory on the slightest provocation, may have been very nice folks in their way. But I must confess, I don't admire their style, and will pass them by. I suppose they meant well, and so in the novel and fiction language of the newspapers, peas to their ashes. There was no discount, however, on them brave men who fit, bled, and died in the American Revolution. We needn't be afraid of setting them up too steep. Like my show, they will stand any amount of praise. G. Washington was about uh, the best man this world ever sought eyes on. He was a clear-headed, warm-hearted, and steady-going man. He never slopped over. The prevailing weakness of most public men is to slop over put them words in large letters, A.W. They get filled up and slop. They rush things. They travel too much on the high-pressure principle. 
they get on to the first poplar hobby horse which trots along not caring a cent whether the beast is ever going clear-sighted and sound or spavined blind and balky of course they get throwed eventually if not sooner when they see the multitude going it blind they go pell-mell with it instead of exerting themselves to set it right they can't see that the crowd which is now bearing them triumphantly on its shoulders will soon discover its error and cast them into the hoss pond of oblivion without the slightest hesitation washington never slopped over that wasn't george's style he loved his country dearly he wasn't after the spiles he was a human angel in a three-cornered hat and knee breeches and we shan't see his like right away my friends we can't all be washingtons but we can be patriots and behave ourselves in a human and a christian manner when we see a brother going downhill to ruin let us not give him a push but let us seize right hold of his coat-tails and draw him back to morality imagine g washington and p henry in the character of secessors as well fancy john bunyan and dr watts in spangled tights doing the trapeze in a one-horse circus i tell you feller citizens it would have been ten dollars in jeff davis's pocket if he'd never been born be sure and vote at least once in all elections buckle on your armor and go to the polls see to it that your neighbor is there see that the cripples are provided with carriages go to the polls and stay all day beware of the infamous lies which the opposition will be certain to get up for political effect on the eve of election to the polls and when you get there vote just as you darn please this is a privilege we all possess and it is one of the booties of this great and free land i see much to admire in new england your gals in particular are about as snug built pieces of caliker as i ever saw they are fully equal to the corn-fed gals of ohio and indiany and will make the bestest kind of wives it sets my bosom on fire to look at em be still my soul be still and you heart stop cutting up i like your schoolhouses your meetin houses your enterprise gumption etc but your favorite beverage i disgust i allude to new england rum it is worse than the corn whiskey of indiana which eats through stone jugs and will turn the stomach of the most shiftless hog i seldom seek consolation in the flowing bowl but t'other day i worried down some of your rum the first class induced me to swear like an infuriated trooper on taking the second glass i was seized with a desire to break winders and arter imbibing the third glass i knocked a small boy down picked his pocket of a new york ledger and wildly commenced reading sylvanius cobb's last tale it's dreadful stuff a sort of uh, liquid lightning got up under the personal supervision of the devil tears men's innards all to pieces and makes their noses blossom as the lobster shun it as you would a wild hyena with a firebrand tied to his tail and while you air about it you will do a first-rate thing for yourself and everybody about you by shunning all kinds of intoxicating liquors you don't need em no more than a cat needs two tails saying nothing about the trouble and suffering they cause but unless your innards are cast iron avoid new england's favorite beverage my friends i'm done i tear myself away from you with tears in my eyes and a pleasant odor of onions about my clothes in the language of mr catterline of the rummins i go but perhaps i shall come back again adieu people of weathersfield be virtuous and you'll be happy end of chapter three Chapter Four of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part Two: War, by Charles Farrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: The War Fever in Baldinsville. As soon as I recuperated my physical system, I went over into the village. 
The peasantry was glad to see me. The schoolmaster said it was cheering to see that gigantic intellect among them once more. That's what he called me. I like the schoolmaster, and I always send him to backer when I'm off on a traveling campaign. Besides, he is a very sensible man. Such men should be encouraged. They don't get news very fast in Baldinsville. There's nothing but a plank road runs in there twice a week, and that's very much out of repair. So my neighbors wasn't much posted up in regard to the wars. Squire Baxter said he would voted the Democratic ticket for going on 40 year, and the war was a damn black Republican lie. Joe Stackpole, who kills hogs for the squire and has a powerful muscle into his arms, said he'd bet five dollars he could lick the crisis in a fair stand-up fight if he wouldn't draw a knife on him. So it went. Some was for war and some was for peace. The schoolmaster, however, said the slave oligarchy must cower at the feet of the North ere a year had flowed by or pass over his dead corpse. Esto perpetua, he added. And sine qua non also, said I, sternly, wishing to make an impression unto the villagers. Requiescat in pace, said the schoolmaster. Too true, too true, I answered. It's a scandalous fact. The newspapers got along at last chock full of war, and the patriotic fever fairly burst out in Baldinsville. Squire Baxter said he didn't believe in coercion, not one of them, and could prove by a file of eagles of liberty in his garret that it was all a Whig lie, got up to raise the price of whiskey and destroy our other liberties. But the old squire got pretty riley when he heard how the rebels was cutting up, and he said he reckoned he would scour up his old musket and do a little square fightin' for the old flag, which had allers been on the ticket he'd voted, and he was too old to bolt now. Squire is all right at heart, but it takes longer for him to fill his venerable biler with steam than it used to when he was young and frisky. As I previously informed you, I am captain of the Baldinsville's company. I riz gradually but majestically from drummer's secretary to my present position, but I found the ranks weren't full by no means and commenced for to recruit. Having noticed a general desire on the part of young men who are into the crisis to wear epaulets, I determined to have my company composed exclusively of officers, everybody to rank as Brigadier General. The following was among the various questions which I put to recruits. Do you know a masked battery from a hunk of gingerbread? Do you know an epaulet from a piece of chalk? If I trust you with a real gun, how many men of your own company do you expect you can manage to kill during the war? Have you ever heard of General Price of Missouri, and can you avoid similar accidents in case of a battle? Have you ever had the measles, and if so, how many? How are you now? Show me your tongue, etc., etc. Some of the questions was sarcastical. The company filled up rapid, and last Sunday we went to the meeting house in full uniform. I had a serious time getting into my military harness, as it was built for me many years ago. But I finally got inside of it, though it fitted me pretty close. Howsoever, once into it, I looked fine. In fact, all inspiring. Do you know me, Mrs. Ward? said I, walking into the kitchen. No, you, you old fool. Of course I do. I saw at once. She did. I started for the meetin' house, and I'm afraid I tried to walk too straight, for I come very near fallin' over backwards, and in attempting to recover myself, my sword got mixed up with my legs, and I fell in among a choice collection of young ladies, who was standin' near the church door, a seein' the soldier boys come up. My cocked hat fell off, and somehow my coat tails got twisted round my neck. The young ladies put their handkerchiefs to their mouths and remarked, tee-hee, while my ancient female single friend, Sari Peasley, bust out in a loud laugh. She exercised her mouth so violently that her new false teeth fell out onto the ground. Miss Peasley, said I, getting up and dusting myself, you must be more careful with them store teeth of yourn, or you'll have to gum it again. Methinks I had her. I'd been to work hard all the week, and I felt rather snoozy. I'm afraid I did get half asleep. For on hearing the minister ask, why was man made to mourn, 
I said, I give it up, having a vague idea that it was a condrum. It was an unfortunate remark, for the whole meeting house looked at me with mingled surprise and indignation. I was about rising to a pint of order when it suddenly occurred to me where I was, and I kept my seat blushing like the red, red rose, so to speak. The next morning I rose with the lark. N.B. I don't sleep with the lark, though. A joke. My little daughter was executing ballads, accompanying herself with the accordion, and she wished me to linger and hear her sing. Hark, I hear a angel singing. A angel now is on to the wing. Well, let him fly, my child, said I, a buckling on my armor. I must forth to my biz. We are progressing pretty well with our drill. As all air commanding officers, there ain't no jealousy, and as we air all exceeding smart, it ain't worth while to try to outstrip each other. The idea of a company composed exclusively of commanders in chief originated, I suppose I scarcely need say, in these brain. Considered as an idea, I flatter myself it is pretty hefty. We've got all the tactics at our tongue's end, but what we particularly excel in is resting muskets. We can rest muskets with anybody. Our corpse will do its duty. We go to the aid of Columbia. We fight for the stars. We'll be chopped into sausage meat before we'll exhibit our coat tails to the foe. We'll fight till there's nothing left of us but our little toes, and even they shall defiantly wiggle. Ever of thee, A. Ward. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part Two: War, by Charles Ferrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Chapter Five: A War Meeting. Our complaint just now is war meetings. They've been having them bad in various parts of our cheerful republic, and naturally we caught them here in Baldinsville. They broke out all over us. They're better attended than the Eclipse was. I remember how people poured into our town last spring to see the eclipse. They labored into an impression that they couldn't see it to home, and so they come up to our place. I cleared a very handsome amount of money by exhibiting the eclipse to them in an open top tent. But the crowds is bigger now. Posey County is aroused. I may say, indeed, that the Prey Hay Ories of Indiana is on fire. Our big meeting came off the other night, and our old friend of the Bugle was elected chairman. The Bugle Horn of Liberty is one of Baldenville's most eminent institutions. The advertisements are well written, and the deaths and marriages are conducted with signal ability. The editor, Mr. Slinkers, is a polished, sarcastic writer. Folks in these parts will not soon forget how he used up the Eagle of Freedom a family journal published at Snootville, near here. The controversy was about a plank road. The road may be, as our contemporary says, a humbug, but our aunt isn't bald-headed, and we haven't got a one-eyed sister Sal. Wonder if the editor of the Eagle of Freedom sees it. Yeah, this used up the Eagle of Freedom feller, because his aunt's head does present a skinned appearance, and his sister Sarah is very much one-eyed. For a genteel home thrust, Mr. Slinker has few eagles. He's a man of great pluck, likewise. He has a fierce nostril, and I believe, upon my soul, that if it wasn't absolutely necessary for him to remain here and announce in his paper from week to week that our government is about to take vigorous measures to put down the rebellion, I believe, upon my soul, this illustrious man would enlist as a brigadier general and get his bounty. I was fixing myself up to attend the great war meeting when my daughter entered with a young man who was evidently from the city, and who wore long hair and had a wild expression into his eye. In one hand he carried a portfolio, and his other paw clasped a bunch of small brushes. My daughter introduced him as Mr. Swibier, the distinguished landscape painter from Philadelphia. He is an artist, Papa. Here is one of his masterpieces a young mother gazing admiringly upon her firstborn, and 
my daughter showed me a really pretty picture done in oil is it not beautiful papa he throws so much soul into his work oh does he does he said i well i reckon i'd better hire him to whitewash our fence it needs it what will you charge sir i continued to throw some soul into my fence my daughter went out of the room in very short meter taking the artist with her and from the emphatical manner in which the door slammed i concluded she was somewhat disgusted at my remarks she closed the door i may say in italics i went into the closet and larfed all alone by myself for over half an hour i larfed so violently that the preserved jars rattled like a cavalry officer's sword and things which is aroused my betsy who came and opened the door pretty sudden she seized me by the few lonely hairs that still linger sadly upon my barefooted head and dragged me out of the closet incidentally observing that she didn't exactly see why she should be compelled at her advanced stage of life to open a asylum for superannuated idiots my wife is one of the best women on this continent although she isn't always gentle as a lamb with mint sauce no no not always but to return to the war meeting it was largely attended the editor of the bugle arose and got up and said the fact could no longer be disguised that we were involved in a war human gore said he is flowing all able-bodied men should seize a musket and march to the tented field i repeat it sir to the tented field a voice why don't you go yourself you old blowhard i am identified young man with an archimedean lever which moves the world said the editor wiping his auburn brow with his left coat tail i allude young man to the press terms two dollars a year invariably in advance job printing executed with neatness and dispatch and with this brilliant burst of elegance the editor introduced mr j brutus hinkins who is suffering from an attack of college in a neighboring place mr hinkins said washington was not safe who can save our national capital dan Setchel, i said he can do it afternoons let him plant his light and airy form onto the long bridge make faces at the hireland foe and they'll skedaddle old setch can do it i call the napoleon of showmen said the editor of the bugle i call that napoleonic man whose life is adorned with so many noble virtues and whose giant mind lights up this warlike scene i call him to order i will remark in this connection that the editor of the bugle does my job printing you said mr hinkins who live away from the busy haunts of men do not comprehend the magnitude of the crisis the busy haunts of men is where people comprehend this crisis we who live in the busy haunts of men that is to say we dwell as it were in the busy haunts of men i really trust that gentleman will not fail to say something about the busy haunts of men before he sits down said i i claim the right to express my sentiments here said mr hinkins in a slightly indignant tone and i shall brook no interruption if i am a sophomore well, you couldn't be more soft my young friend i observed whereupon there was cries of order order i regret i can't mingle in this strife personally said the young man oh, you might enlist as a liberty pole said i in a silvery whisper but he added i have a voice and that voice is for war the young man then closed his speech with some striking and original remarks in relation to the star-spangled banner he was followed by the village minister a very worthy man indeed but whose sermons have a tendency to make people sleep pretty industriously i am willing to enlist for one he said what's your weight parson i asked a hundred and sixty pounds he said well you can enlist as a hundred and sixty pounds of morphine your duty being to stand in the hospitals after a battle and preach while the surgical operations is being performed think how much you'd save the government in morphine he didn't seem to see it but he made a good speech and the editor of the bugle rose to read the resolutions commencing as follows resolved that we view with anxiety the fact that there is now a war going on and re 
resolved that we believe stonewall jackson sympathizes with the secession movement and that we hope the nine months men at this point he was interrupted by the sounds of silvery footsteps on the stairs and a party of women carrying guns and led by betsy jane who brandished a loud and rattling umbrella busting it into the room here cried i are some nine months women mrs ward said the editor of the bugle mrs ward and ladies what means this extraordinary demonstration it means said that remarkable female that you men are making fools of yourselves you are willing to talk and urge others to go to the wars but you don't go to the wars yourselves war meetings is all very nice in their way but they don't keep stonewall jackson from coming over to maryland and helping himself to the fat test beef critters what we want is more cider and less talk we want you able-bodied men to stop speechifying which don't mount to the wiggle of a sick cat's tail and to go fightin'. Otherwise, you can stay at home and take care of the children while we women will go to the wars. Gentlemen, said I, that's my wife. Go in, old gal. And I throwed up my ancient white hat in perfect raptures. Is this roll book to be filled up with the names of men or women, she cried. With men, with men, and our quota was made up that very night. There is a great deal of gas about these war meetings. A war meeting, in fact, without gas would be something like the play of Hamlet with the part of Othello omitted. Still believing that the goddess of liberty is about as well shot up as any young lady in distress could expect to be, I am yours more than anybody else's, A. Ward. End of chapter 5《ジャプター6、オブ・ザ・コンプリート・ワークス・オブ・アーティマス・ウォード・パート2・ウォー・バイ・チャールズ・フェラー・ブラウン。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 The Draft in Baldensville If I'm drafted, I shall resign. Deeply grateful for the unexpected honor thus conferred upon me, I shall feel compelled to resign the position in favor of some more worthy person. Modesty is what ails me. That's what's kept me under. And I mean to say, I shall have to resign if I'm drafted everywhere as I've been enrolled. I must now, for instance, be enrolled in upwards of 200 different towns. If I'd kept on traveling, I could have eventually become a brigade, in which case I could have held a meeting and elected myself Brigadier General quite unanimous. I had no idea there were so many of me before. But, seriously, I concluded to stop exhibiting and make tracks for Baldensville. My only daughter threw herself onto my bosom and said, It is me, father, I thank the gods. She reads the ledger. Tip us your f bunch of fives, old faker, said Artemis Jr. He reads the clipper. My wife was to the sewing circle. I knew she and the women folks was having a pleasant time slandering the females of the other sewing circle, which likewise met that afternoon and was doubtless enjoying themselves equally well in slandering the first named circle. And I didn't send for her. I always like to see people enjoy themselves. My son Augustus was playing onto a flute. Augustus is a ethereal cuss. The twins was uh, building cob houses in the corner of the kitchen. It'll cost some postage stamps to raise this family, and yet it'd go hard with the old man to lose any lamb of the flock. An old bachelor is a poor critter. He may have heard the Skylark, or what nearly the same thing, Miss Kellogg and Carlotti Patty sing. He may have heard Ole Bull fiddle, and all the Dodworths toot, and yet he don't know nothing about music. The real genuine thing, the music of the laughter of happy, well-fed children. And you may ask the father of six children home to dinner, feeling very sure there'll be no spoons missing when he goes away. Six fathers never drop tin five-cent pieces into the contribution box, nor palm shoe pegs off onto blind hosses for oats, nor skedaddle to British sile when their country's in danger nor do anything which is really mean, 
I don't mean to intimate that the old bachelor is up to little games of this sort, not at all. But I repeat, he's a poor critter. He don't live here, only stays. He ought to apologize on behalf of his parents for being here at all. The happy married man dies in good style at home, surrounded by his weeping wife and children. The old bachelor don't die at all. He sorts of rots away like a pollywog's tail. My townsmen were sort of demoralized. There was evident design to evade the graft, as I observed with sorrow, and patriotism was below par, and mar, too, at Judas Pritt. I hadn't no sooner sat down on the piazza of the tavern than I saw sixteen solitary horsemen riding four abreast, wending their way up the street. What's them? Is it cavalry? That, said the landlord, is the stage. Sixteen able-bodied citizens had literally bought the stage between here and Scottsburg. That's them. They're stage drivers. Stage drivers is exempt. I saw that each stage driver carried a letter in his left hand. The mail is heavy today, said the landlord. Generally, they don't have more than half a dozen letters between them. Today, they got one apiece. Bile, my lights and liver. And the passengers? Well, there ain't any, scarcely nowadays, said the landlord. And what few there is very much prefer to walk. The roads is so rough. And how is it with you? I inquired of the editor of the Bugle Horn of Liberty, who sat near me. I can't go, he said, shaking his head in a wise way. Ordinarily, I should delight to wade in gore, but my bleeding country bids me stay at home. It is imperatively necessary that I remain here for the purpose of announcing from week to week that our government is about to take vigorous measures to put down the rebellion. I strolled into the village oyster saloon where I found Dr. Swayze, a leading citizen in a state of mind which showed that he'd been heisting in more than his share of heisen. Hello, old beeswax, he bellered. How's your grandmams? When you gonna feed your stuffed animals? What's the matter with the eminent physician? I pleasantly inquired. Uh, this, he said, this is the matter. I'm a habitual drunkard. I'm exempt. Just so. Do you see them beans, old man? And he pointed to a plate before him. Do you see them? I do. They are a cheerful fruit when used temperately. Well, said he, I ain't eat anything since last week. I eat beans now because I eat beans then. I never mix my vittles. Well, it's quite proper you should eat a little something once in a while, I said. It's a good idea to occasionally instruct the stomach that it mustn't depend exclusively on liquor for its sustenance. A blessing, he cried, a blessing unto the head of the man what invented beans, a blessing unto his head. Which his name is Gilson. He's a first family of Boston, said I. This is a specimen of how things was going in my place of residence. A few was true blue. The schoolmaster was among them. He greeted me warmly. He said I was welcome to those shores. He said I had a massive mind. It was gratifying, he said, to see the great intellect stalking in their midst once more. I have often before had occasion to notice this schoolmaster. He is evidently a young man of far more than ordinary talents. The schoolmaster proposed we should get up a mass meeting. The meeting was largely attended. We held it in the open air, round a roaring bonfire. The schoolmaster was the first orator. He's pretty good on the speak. He also writes well, his composition being seldom marred by ingrammaticisms. He said this inactivity surprised him. What do you expect will come of this kind of doings? Nihil fit. Hurrah for Nihil, I interrupted. Feller citizens, let's give three cheers for Nihil, the man who fit. The schoolmaster turned a little red, but repeated, Nihil fit. Exactly, I said. Nihil fit. He wasn't a strategy feller. Our uh, venerable friend, said the schoolmaster, smiling pleasantly, isn't posted in Virgil. No, I don't know him. But if he's an able-bodied man, he must stand his little draft. 
the schoolmaster wound up in eloquent style and the subscriber took the stand i said the crisis had not only come itself but it had brought all its relations it has come i said with evident intention of making us a good long visit it's going to take off its things and stop with us my wife says so too this is a good war for those who like this war it's just the kind of war as they like i'll bet you my wife says so too if the federal army succeeds in taking washington and they seem to be advancing that way pretty often i shall say it is strategy and washington will be safe and that noble banner as it were that banner as it were will be an emblem or rather i should say that noble banner as it were my wife says so too i, I got a little mixed up here but they didn't notice it keep mum feller citizens it will be a proud day for this republic when washington is safe my wife says so too the editor of the buglehorn of liberty here arose and said i do not wish to interrupt the gentleman but a impertinent dispatch has just been received at the telegraph office here i will read it it is as follows government is about to take vigorous measures to put down the rebellion loud applause that said i is cheering that's soothing and washington will be safe sensation philadelphia is safe general patterson's in philadelphia but my heart bleeds particularly for washington my wife says so too there's money enough no trouble about money they've got a lot of first-class banknote engravers at washington which place i regret to say is by no means safe who turn out two or three cords of money a day good money too goes well these banknote engravers make good wages i expect they lay up properly they are full of union sentiment there is considerable union sentiment in virginia more especially among the honest farmers of the shenandoah valley my wife says so too then it isn't money we want but we do want men and we must have them we must carry a whirlwind of fire among the foe we must crush the ungrateful rebels who are pounding the goddess of liberty over the head with slung shots and stabbing her with stolen knives we must lick em quick we must introduce a large number of first-class funerals among the people of the south betsy says so too this war hain't been too well managed we all know that what then we are all in the same boat if the boat goes down we go down with her hence we must all fight it ain't no use to talk now about who caused the war that's played out the war is upon us upon us all and we must all fight we can't reason the matter with the foe when in the broad glare of the noonday sun a speckled jackass boldly and maliciously kicks over a peanut stand do we reason with him i guess not and why reason with those other southern people who are trying to kick over the republic betsy my wife says so too the meeting broke up with enthusiasm we shan't draft in baldinsville if we can help it end of chapter six Chapter 7 of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part 2, War, by Charles Farrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7, Surrender of Cornwallis. It was customary in many of the inland towns in New England some thirty years ago to celebrate the anniversary of the surrender of Lord Cornwallis by a sham representation of that important event in the history of the revolutionary war a town meeting would be called at which a company of men would be detailed as british and a company as americans two leading citizens being selected to represent washington and cornwallis in mimic surrender the pleasant little town of w in whose schools the writer has been repeatedly corrected upon whose ponds he has often skated upon whose richest orchards he has with other juvenile bandits or many times dashed in the silent midnight the town of w where it was popularly believed these bandits would come to a bad end 
resolved to celebrate the surrender. Rival towns had celebrated, and W. determined to eclipse them in the most signal manner. It is my privilege to tell you how W. succeeded in this determination. The great day came. It was ushered in by the roar of musketry, the ringing of the village church bell, the squeaking of fifes, and the rattling of drums. People poured into the village from all over the county. Never had W. experienced such a jam. Never had there been such an onslaught upon gingerbread carts. Never had New England rum, for this was before Neil Dow's day, flowed so freely. And W.'s fair daughters, who mounted the housetops to see the surrender, had never looked fairer. The old folks came, too, and among them were several war-scarred heroes who had fought gallantly at Monmouth and Yorktown. These brave sons of 76 took no part in the demonstration, but an honored bench was set apart for their exclusive use on the piazza of Sile Smith's store. When they were dry, all they had to do was to sing out to Sile's boy Jerry, A little New England this way, if you please. It was brought forthwith. At precisely nine o'clock by the schoolmaster's new leaping watch, the American and British forces marched on to the village green and placed themselves in battle array, reminding the spectators of the time when Brave Wolf drew up his men in a style most pretty on the plains of Abraham before the city. The character of Washington had been assigned to Squire Wood, a well-to-do and influential farmer, while that of Cornwallis had been given to the village lawyer a kind-hearted but rather pompous person whose name was Caleb Jones. Squire Wood, the Washington of the occasion, had met with many unexpected difficulties in preparing his forces, and in his perplexity he had emptied not only his own canteen, but those of most of his aides. The consequence was, mortifying it must be to all true Americans, blushing as I do to tell it, Washington, at the commencement of the mimic struggle, was most unqualifiedly drunk. The sham fight commenced. Bang, bang, bang from the Americans. Bang, bang, bang from the British. The bangs were kept hotly up until the powder gave out, and then came the order to charge. Hundreds of wooden bayonets flashed fiercely in the sunlight, each soldier taking very good care not to hit anybody. Last <laughs> rat! shouted Washington, who during the shooting had been racing his horse wildly up and down the line. That's right, get it to em. cut their darnel heads off. On Romans, shrieked Cornwallis, who had once seen a theatrical performance and remembered the heroic appeals of the thespian belligerents. On to the fray, no sleep till morning. Let ye out all their bowels, yelled Washington, and down with taxation on tea. The fighting now ceased, the opposing forces were properly arranged, and Cornwallis, dismounting, prepared to present his sword to Washington according to program. As he walked slowly toward the father of his country, he rehearsed the little speech he had committed for the occasion, while the illustrious being who was to hear it was making desperate efforts to keep in his saddle. Now he would wildly brandish his sword and narrowly escape cutting off his horse's ears, and then he would fall suddenly forward onto the steed's neck, grasping the mane as drowning men seize hold of straws. He was giving an inimitable representation of Toodles on horseback. All idea of the magnitude of the occasion had left him, and when he saw Cornwallis approaching with slow and stately step and sword hilt extended toward him, he inquired, what in devil you want, any <gasps> how? General Washington, said Cornwallis, in dignified and impressive tones, I render you my sword. I need not inform you, sir, how deeply the speech was here suddenly cut short by Washington, who, driving the spurs into his horse, playfully attempted to ride over the commander of the British forces. He was not permitted to do this for his aides, seeing his unfortunate condition, seized the horse by the bridle, straightened Washington up in his saddle, and requested Cornwallis to proceed with his remarks. 
General Washington, said Cornwallis, the British lion prostrates itself at the feet of the American eagle. Eagle, eagle, yelled the infuriated Washington, rolling off his horse and hitting Cornwallis a frightful blow on the head with the flat of his sword. Do you call me a eagle, you mean sneaking cuss? He struck him again, sending him to the ground, and said, I'll learn you to call me a eagle, you infernal scoundrel. Cornwallis remained upon the ground only a moment. Smarting from the blows he had received, he arose with an entirely unlooked-for recuperation on the part of the fallen, and in direct defiance of historical example, in spite of the men of both nations indeed, he whipped the immortal Washington until he roared for mercy. The Americans, at first mortified and indignant at the conduct of their chief, now began to sympathize with him, and resolved to whip their mock foes in earnest. They rushed fiercely upon them, but the British were really the stronger party, and drove the Americans back. Not content with this, they charged madly upon them and drove them from the field, from the village, in fact. There were many heads damaged, eyes draped in mourning, noses fractured and legs lamed. It is a wonder that no one was killed outright. Washington was confined to his house for several weeks, but he recovered at last. For a time there was a coolness between himself and Cornwallis, but they finally concluded to join the whole county in laughing about the surrender. They live now. Time, the artist, has thoroughly whitewashed their heads, but they are very jolly still. On town meeting days, the old squire always rides down to the village. In the hind part of his venerable yellow wagon is always a bunch of hay, ostensibly for the old white horse, but really to hide a glass bottle from the vulgar gaze. This bottle has on one side a likeness of Lafayette, and upon the other may be seen the goddess of liberty. What the bottle contains inside I cannot positively say, but it is true that Squire Wood and Lawyer Jones visit that bottle very frequently on town meeting days and come back looking quite red in the face. When this redness in the face becomes of the blazing kind, as it generally does by the time the polls close, a short dialogue like this may be heard. We shall never play surrender again, Lawyer Jones. Them days is over, Squire Wood. End of chapter 7、chapter 8 of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part 2 War by Charles Farrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Things in New York. The student and connoisseur must have noticed and admired in various parts of the United States of America large yellow handbills, which not only are gems of art in their cells, but they truthfully set forth the attractions of my show. A show, let me here observe, that contains many living wild animals, every one of which has got a beautiful moral. Them handbills is sculpted in New York. And I annually repair there to get some more of them. And being here, I thought I'd issue an address to the public on matters and things. Since last I meandered these streets, I have been all over the Pacific Slopes and Utah. I come back now with my virtue unimpaired, but I've got to get some new clothes. Many changes h a s taken place even during my short absence. And some on em is solemn to contemplate. The house in Varick Street, where I used to board, is being torn down. That house, which was rendered memorable by my living into it, is parsing away, parsing away. But some of the timbers will be made into canes, which will be sold to my admirers at the low price of one dollar each. Thus is changes going on continually. In the New World it is war. In the Old World empires is tottering and dynasteries is crumbling. These canes is cheap at a dollar. Sammy Booth, Duane Street, sculpts my handbills and he's an artist. He studied in Rome, state of New York. 
I'm here to read the proof sheets of my handbills as fast as they're sculpted. You have to watch these ear printers pretty close, for they're just as apt to spell a word wrong as anyhow. But I have time to look around some, and how do I find things? I return to the Atlantic States after an absence of ten months, and what state do I find the country in? Why, I don't know what state I find it in. Suffice it to say that I do not find it in the state of New Jersey. I find some things that is cheering, particularly the resolve on the part of the women of America to stop wearing furrin goods. I never meddle with my wife's things. She may wear muslin from Greenland's icy mountains and bombazine from Inji's coral strands if she wants to, but I'm glad to state that that superior woman has peeled off all her furrin clothes and jumped into fabrics of domestic manufacture. But, says some folks, if you stop important things, you stop the revenue. That's all right. We can stand it if the revenue can. On the same principle, young men should continue to get drunk on French brandy and to smoke their livers as dry as a corn cob with QB cigars. Because, forsooth, if they don't, it will hurt the revenue. This talk about the revenue is of the bosh boshy. One thing is tolerable certain. If we don't send gold out of the country, we shall have the consolation of knowing that it is in the country. So I say, great credit is due the women for this patriotic move. And to tell the truth, the women generally know what they're about. Of all the blessings, they're the soothingest. If there'd never been any women, where would my children be today? But I hope this move will lead to other moves that are just as much needed, one of which is a general and a thorough curtailment of expenses all around. The fact is, we are getting terribly extravagant, and unless we pause in our mad career in less than two years, the goddess of liberty will be seen dodging into a pawnbroker's shop with the other gown done up in a bundle, even if she don't have to spout the gold stars on her headband. Let us take hold jointly, and live and dress sensibly, like our forefathers who knowed more than we do, if they weren't quite so honest, subtle joketh. There are other cheering signs for Meriki. We don't, for instance, lack great generals, and we certainly don't brave soldiers. But there's one thing I wish we did lack, and that is our present Congress. I venture to say that if you search the earth all over with a ten-horsepower microscope, you won't be able to find such another pack of poppycock gabblers as the present Congress of the United States of America would be able to find among their constituents. Gentlemen of the Senate and of the House, you've sat there and drawed your pay and made summer complaint speeches long enough. The country at large, including the undersigned, is disgusted with you. Why don't you show us a statesman, somebody who can make a speech that will hit the popular heart right under the great public waistcoat? Why don't you show us a statesman who can rise up to the emergency and cave in the emergency's head? Congress, you won't do. Go home, you miserable devils, go home. At a special congressional election in my district the other day, I deliberately voted for Henry Clay. I admit that Henry is dead, but inasmuch as we don't seem to have a live statesman in our National Congress, let us by all means have a first-class corpse. Them who think that a cane made from the timbers of the house I once boarded in is essential to their happiness should not delay about sending the money right on for one. My uh, reported capture by the North American savages of Utah led my wide circle of friends and creditors to think that I had bid adieu to earthly things and was an angel playing on a golden harp. Hence my rival home was unexpected. It was 11 p.m. when I reached my homestead and knocked a healthy knock on the door thereof. A nightcap thrusted itself out of the front chamber window. It was my Betsy's nightcap, and a voice said, Who is it? It is a man, I answered in a gruff voice. 
I don't believe it, she said. Then come down and search me, I replied. Then, resuming my natural voice, I said, It is your own A.W., Betsy, sweet lady, wait, ever of thou. Oh, she said, it's you, is it? I thought I smelt something. But the old girl was glad to see me. In the morning, I found that my family were entertaining an artist from Philadelphia, who was there painting some startling waterfalls and mountains, and I more in suspected he had a hankering for my oldest daughter. Mr. Skimmerhorn, father, said my daughter. Glad to see you, sir, I replied in a hospital voice. Glad to see you. He is an artist, father, said my child. Oh, uh, which is it? A artist, a painter. And glazer, I asked. Are you a painter and a glazer, sir? My daughter and wife was mad, but I couldn't help it. I felt in a comical mood. It is a wonder to me, sir, said the artist, considering what a widespread reputation you have, that some of our eastern managers don't secure you. It's a wonder to me, said I to my wife, that somebody don't secure him with a chain. After breakfast, I went over to town to see my old friends. The editor of the Bugle greeted me cordially and showed me the following article he'd just written about the paper on the other side of the street. We have recently put up in our office an entirely new sink of unique construction with two holes through which the soiled water may pass to the new bucket underneath. What will the hell-hounds of the advertiser say to this? We shall continue to make improvements as fast as our rapidly increasing business may warrant. Wonder whether a certain editor's wife thinks she can palm off a brass watch chain on this community for a gold one. That, says the editor, hits him where he lives. That will close him up as bad as it did when I wrote an article ridiculing his sister, who's got a cock eye. A few days after my return, I was shown a young man who says he'll be damned if he goes to the war. He was sitting on a barrel and was indeed a loathsome object. Last Sunday, I heard Parson Batkins preach, and the good old man preached well, too, though his prayer was rather lengthy. The editor of the Bugle, who was with me, said that prayer would make fifteen squares, solid, non-pareil. I don't think of nothing more to write about. So, believe me, of all those endearing young charms, etc., etc., a ward. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part Two, War, by Charles Farrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: Touching Letter from a Gory Member of the Home Guard. Broadway, December tenth, sixty one. Dear Father and Mother, we are all getting along very well. We mess at Delmonico's. Do not repine for your son. Some must suffer for the glorious stars and stripes, and dear parents, why shouldn't I? Tell Mrs. Sculler that we do not need the blankets she so kindly sent to us as we bunk at the St. Nicholas and Metropolitan. What our brave lads stand most in need of now is fruitcake and waffles. Do not weep for me. Henry Adolphus End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part 2, War, by Charles Farrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. In Canada. I'm at prison existing under a monocle form of government. In other words, I'm traveling through the crowned heads of Canada. They ain't pretty bad people. On the contrary, they're exceeding good people. True, they are deprived of many blessings. They don't enjoy, for instance, the priceless boon of war. They haven't any American eagle to unchain, and they hain't got a Fourth of July to their backs. Although this is a monocle form of government, I am unable to perceive much monarchy. I tried to get a peace in Toronto, but failed to succeed. 
mrs victoria who is queen of england and has all the luxuries of the markets including game in its season don't bother herself much about canady but lets her do about as she might her she however generally keeps her supplied with a lord who's called a governor general sometimes the politicians of canady make it lively for this lord for canady has politicians and i expect they don't differ from our politicians some of them being gifted and talented liars no doubt the present governor-general of canady is lord monk i saw him review some volunteers at montreal he was accompanied by some other lords and dukes and generals and those sorts of things he rode a little bay horse and his close wasn't any better than mine you'll always notice by the way that the higher up in the world a man is the less good harness he puts on hence general halleck walks the streets in plain citizen's dress while the second lieutenant of a volunteer regiment piles all the brass things he can find onto his back and drags a forty-pound sword after him monk has been in the lord business some time and i understand it pays though i don't know what a lord's wages is the wages of sin is death and postage stamps but this has nothing to do with monk one of lord monk's daughters rode with him on the field she has golden hair a kind good face and wore a red hat i should be very happy to have her pay me and my family a visit at baldinsville come and bring your knitting miss monk mrs ward will do the fair thing by you she makes the best slapjacks in america as a slapjackist she has no equal she wears the belt what the review was all about i don't know i haven't a gigantic intellect which can grasp great questions at once i am not a webster or a seymour i am not a washington or a old abe for from it i am not as gifted a man as henry ward beecher even the congregation of plymouth meeting house in brooklyn will admit that yes i should think so but while i don't have the slightest idea as to what the review was for i will state that the soldiers look pretty scrumptious in their red and green clothes come with me gentle reader to quebec quebec was surveyed and laid out by a gentleman who had been afflicted with the delirium tremens from childhood and hence his ideas of things was a little irregular the streets don't lead anywheres in particular but everywheres in general the city is built on a variety of a perpendicular hills each hill being a trifle worse nor t'other one quebec is full of stone walls and arches and citadels and things it is said no foe could ever get into quebec and i guess they couldn't i don't see what they'd want to get in there for quebec has seen lively times in a warlike way the french and britishers had a set to there in seventeen fifty nine jim wolfe commanded the latters and joe montcalm the formers both were hunky boys and fit nobly but wolfe was too many measles for montcalm and the french was slewed wolfe and montcalm was both killed in harder years a common monument was erected by the generous people of quebec aided by a bully earl named george dalhousie to these noble fellows that was well done during the revolutionary war b arnold made his way through dense woods and thick snows from maine to quebec which is one of the hunkiest things ever done in the military line it would have been better if b arnold's funeral had come off immediately on his arrival there on the plains of abraham there was once some tall fighting and ever since there had been a great demand for the bones of the slewed on that occasion but the real genuine bones was long ago carried off and now the boys make a handsome thing by carting the bones of hosses and sheep out there and selling them to intelligent american tourists taking a professional view of this dodge i must say that it betrays genius of a lofty character it reminded me of an inspired feat of my own i used to exhibit a wax figure of henry wilkins the boy murderer henry had in a moment of inadvertence killed his uncle ephraim and walked off with the old man's money well this statue was lost somehow 
and not supposing it would make any particular difference i substituted the full-grown statue of one of my distinguished pirates for the boy murderer one night i exhibited to a poor but honest audience in the town of stoneham maine this ladies and gentlemen said i pointing my umbrella that weapon which is indispensable to every true american to the statue this is a lifelike wax figure of the notorious henry wilkins who in the dead of night murdered his uncle ephraim in cold blood a sad warning to all uncles having murderers for nephews when a mere child this henry wilkins was compelled to go to the sunday school he carried no sunday school book the teacher told him to go home and bring one he went and returned with a comic songbook a depraved proceeding but says a man in the audience when you was here before your wax figure represented henry wilkins as a boy now henry was hung and yet you show him to us now as a full-grown man how's that uh, the figure has growed sir it has growed i said i was angry if it had been in these times i think i should have informed to get him as a traitor to his flag and had him put in fort lafayette i say i do to quebec with regret it is old fogeyish but chock full of interest young gentlemen of a romantic turn of mind who are bothering their heads as to how they can spend their father's money had better see quebec altogether i like canady good people and lots of pretty girls i wouldn't mind coming over here to live in the capacity of a duke uh, provided a vacancy occurs and provided further i could be allowed a few star-spangled banners a eagle a boon of liberty etc don't think i've skedaddled not at all i'm coming home in a week let's have the union restored as it was if we can but if we can't i'm in favor of the union as it wasn't but the union anyhow gentlemen of the editorial corps if you would be happy be virtuous i who am the emblem of virtue tell you so signed a ward End of chapter 10chapter 11 of the complete works of artemus ward part 2 war by charles ferrar brown this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 11 the noble red man the red man of the forest was formerly a very respectful person justice to the noble aborigine uh, warrants me in saying that originally he was a majestic cuss at the time Chris arrove on these shores, I allude to Chris Columbus, the savages was virtuous and happy. They were innocent of secession, rum, draw poker, and sinfulness generally. They didn't discuss the slavery question as a custom. They had no Congress, pharaoh banks, delirium tree men's, or associated press. Their habits was consistently good late suppers dyspepsy gas companies thieves ward politicians pretty waiter girls and other metropolitan refinements were unknown among them no savage in good standing would take postage stamps you couldn't have bought a coonskin with a barrel of em the female aborigine never died of consumption because she didn't tie her waist up in whalebone things but in loose and flowing garments she bounded with naked feet over hills and plains like the wild and frisky antelope. It was an unlucky moment for us when Chris sought his foot onto these ere shores. It would have been better for us of the present day if the engines had given him a warm meal and sent him home o'er the raging billers. For the savages owned the country and Columbus was a filibuster. Cortez, Pizarro, and Walker were one-horse filibusters. Columbus was a four-horse team filibuster and a large yeller dog under the wagon. I say, in view of the mess we are making of things, it would have been better for us if Columbus had stayed to home. It would have been better for the show business. The circulation of Vanity Fair would be larger and the proprietors would all have bosom pins. Yes, sir, and perhaps a ten-pin alley. 
by which i don't wish to be understood as intimating that the scalping wretches who are in the engine business at the present day are of any account or calculated to make home happy especially the sea oxes of minnesota who deserve to be murdered in the first degree and if pope will only stay in st paul and not go near him himself i reckon they will be End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part 2, War, by Charles Farrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Artemus Ward in Richmond Richmond, Virginia, May 1865 Olonzo Ward before I commence this letter from the late rebel capital, I desire to simply say that I have seen a low and scurrilous note in the paper from a certain person who signs himself Olonzo Ward and says he is my brother. I did once have a brother of that name, but I do not recognize him now. To me, he is worse than dead. I took him from college some sixteen years ago and gave him a good situation as the bearded woman in my show. How did he repay me for this kindness? He basely undertook, one day while in a bacchanalian mood on rum and right in sight of the audience in the tent, to stand upon his head, whereby he betrayed his sex on account of his boots and his beard falling off his face, thus ruining my prospects in that town and likewise incurring the serious displeasure of the press, which said boldly I was trifling with the feelings of an intelligent public. I know no such man as Olonzo Ward. I do not even wish his name breathed in my presence. I do not recognize him. I perfectly disgust him. Richmond The old man finds himself once more in a sunny climb. I come here a few days after the city caterpillar chillated. My neighbors seemed surprised and astonished at this daring bravery unto the part of a man at my time of life, but our family was never known to quail in danger's stormy hour. My father was a settler in the Revolution War. My father once had an interview with General Lafayette. He asked Lafayette to lend him five dollars, promising to pay him in the fall, but Laffey said, he couldn't see it in those lamps. Laffey was French, and his knowledge of our language was a little shaky. Immediately on my arrival here, I proceeded to the Spotswood house, and calling to my assistants, a young man from our town who writes a good run in hand, I put my autograph on the register, and hand in my umbrella to a bald-headed man behind the counter, who I supposed was Mr. Spotswood, I said, Spotsy, how does she run? He called a colored person and said, Show the gentleman to the cow yard and give him cart number one. Well, isn't Grant here, I said. Perhaps Ulysses wouldn't mind my turning in with him. Do you know the general? inquired Mr. Spotswood. Well, no, not exactly, but, but he'll remember me. His brother-in-law's aunt bought her rye meal of my Uncle Levi all one winter. My Uncle Levi's rye meal was poof pooh said spotsy don't bother me and he shoved my umbrella onto the floor observing to him not to be so careless with that weapon i accompanied the african to my lodgings my brother i said are you aware that you've been emancipated do you realize how glorious it is to be free tell me my dear brother does it not seem like some dreams, or do you realize the great fact in all its living and holy magnitude? He said he would take some gin. I was showed to the cow yard and laid down under a one mule cart. The hotel was awful crowded, and I was sorry I hadn't gone to the Libby prison, though I should have slept comfortable enough if the bedclothes hadn't been pulled off me during the night by a scoundrel who come and hitched a mule to the cart and drove it off. I thus lost my covering, and my throat feels a little husky this morning. General Halleck offers me the hospitality of the city, giving me my choice of hospitals. He has also very kindly placed at my disposal a smallpox ambulance. 
Union sentiment. There is rally a good deal of Union sentiment in this city. I see it on every hand. I met a man today. I am not at liberty to tell his name, but he is an old and influential citizen of Richmond, and says he, Why, we've been fighting again the old flag. Lord bless me, how singular. He then borrowed five dollars of me and bust into a flood of tears. Said another, a man of standing and formerly a bitter rebel, Let us at once stop this effusion of blood. The old flag is good enough for me, sir, he added. You air from the north. Have you a doughnut or a piece of custard pie about you? I told him no, but I knew a man from Vermont who had just organized a sort of restaurant where he could go and make a very comfortable breakfast on New England rum and cheese. He borrowed fifty cents of me, and, asking me to send him William Lloyd Garrison's ambrotype as soon as I got home, he walked off said another there's been a tremendous union feeling here from the first but we was kept down by a reign of terror have you a daguerreotype of wendell phillips about your person and will you lend me four dollars for a few days till we air once more a happy and united people jeff davis now, jeff davis is not popular here she is regarded as a southern sympathizer and yet I'm told he was kind to his parents. She ran away from him many years ago and has never been back. This was showing him a good deal of consideration when we reflect what his conduct had been. Her captor in female apparel confuses me in regard to his sex, and you see I speak of him as a her as frequent as otherwise, and I guess he feels so himself. R. Lee Robert Lee is regarded as a noble feller. He was opposed to the war at the first and drawed his sword very reluctant. In fact, he wouldn't have drawn his sword at all, only he had a large stock of military clothes on hand which he didn't want to waste. He says the colored man is right, and he will at once go to New York and open a Sabbath school for Negro minstrels. The Confederate Army the surrender of R. Lee, J. Johnson, and other leaves the Confederate Army in a rather shattered state. That army now consists of Kirby Smith, four mules, and a bass drum, and is moving rapidly towards Texas. A proud and haughty southerner. Feeling a little peckish, I went into a Eaton house today and encountered a young man with long black hair and slender frame. He didn't wear much clothes, and them as he did wear looked unhealthy. He frowned on me and said, kinder scornful, So, sir, you come here to taunt us in our hour of trouble, do you? No, said I, I come here for hash. Pishaw, he said sneeringly. I mean you air in this city for the purposes of gloating over a fallen people. Others may basely succumb, but as for me, I will never yield. Never, never. Has something to eat, I pleasantly suggested. Tripe and onions, he said firstly. Then he added, I eat with you, but I hate you. You're a low-lived Yankee. To which I pleasantly replied, How you have your tripe? Fried, mudsill, with plenty of ham fat. He ate very ravenous. Poor feller, he had lived on odds and ends for several days eating crackers that had been turned over by revelers in the bread tray at the bar. He got full at last, and his heart softened a little towards me. After all, he said, you have some people at the North who are not wholly loathsome beasts. Well, yes, I said, we have now and then a man among us who isn't a cold-blooded scoundrel. A young man, I mildly but gravely said, this cruel war is over, and you're licked. It's rather necessary for somebody to lick in a good square, lively fight, and in this here case it happens to be the United States of America. You fit splendid, but we was too many for you. Then make the best of it, and let us all give in and put the Republic on a firmer basis nor ever. I don't gloat over your misfortunes, my young friend far from it. I'm an old man now, and my heart is softer nor it once was. You see, my spectacles is mistened with something very like tears. 
I'm thinking of the sea of good rich blood that has been spilt on both sides in this dreadful war. I'm thinking of our widders and orphans, north and of yourn in the south. I can cry for both. Leave me, my young friend. I can place my old hands tenderly on the fair young head of the Virginia maid whose lover was laid low in the battle dust by a federal bullet and say as fervently and piously as a venerable sinner like me can say anything, God be good to you, my poor dear, my poor dear. I riz up to go, and taking my young southern friend kindly by the hand, I said, Young man, adieu. You southern fellers is probably my brothers, though you've occasionally had a cussed queer way of showing it. It's over now. Let us all line in and make a country on this continent that shall give all Europe the cramp in the stomach every time they look at us. Adieu, adieu. And as I am through, I likewise say adieu to you, gentle reader, merely remarking that the star-spangled banner is waving round loose again, and that there don't seem to be anything the matter with the goddess of liberty beyond a slight cold. Artemis Ward End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of the Complete Works of Artemus Ward, Part 2, War, by Charles Farrar Brown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13, Artemus Ward to the Prince of Wales. Friend Wales, you remember me. I saw you in Canada a few years ago. I remember you, too. I seldom forget a person. I heard of your marriage to the Princess Alexandria and meant to writ you a congratulatory letter at the time. But I've been building a barn this summer and ain't had no time to write letters to folks. Excuse me. Numerous changes has taken place since we met in the body politic. The body politic, in fact, is sick. I sometimes think it has got biles, friend Wales. In my country we've got war, while your country, in conjunction with Captain Sims of the Alabama, maintains a neutral position. I'm afraid I can't write jokes when I sit about it. Oh, no, I guess not. Yes, sir, we've got a war, and the true patriot has to make sacrifices. You bet. I have already given two cousins to the war, and I stand ready to sacrifice my wife's brother rather than not see the rebellion crushed. And if wuss comes to wuss, I'll shed every drop of blood my able-bodied relations has got to prosecute the war. I think somebody ought to be prosecuted, and it may as well be the war as anybody else. When I get a joking fit into me, it's no use to try to stop me. You heard about the draft, friend Wales. No doubt it caused some squirming, but it was fairly conducted, I think, for it hit all classes. It is true that Wendell Phillips, who is an American citizen of African scent, escaped, but so did Vallandigham, who is conservative, and who was recently sent south, though he would have been sent to the dry Tortugas if Abe had supposed for a minute that the Tortugases would keep him. We ain't got any daily paper in our town, but we got a female sewing circle which answers the same purpose and we wasn't long in suspect as to who was drafted. One young man who was drawed claimed to be exempt because he was the only son of a widowed mother who supported him. A few able-bodied dead men was drafted, but whether their heirs will have to pay three hundred dollars apiece for them is a question for Whiten, who appears to be tinkering up this draft business right smart. I hope he makes good wages. I think most of the conscripts in this place will go. A few will go to Kennedy, stopping on their way at Concord N.H., where I understand there is a Muslim of hearts. You see, I'm sassy, friend Wales, hitting all sides, but no offense is meant. You know, I ain't a politician and never was. I vote for Mr. Union. That's the only candidate I've got. I claim, howsoever, to have a well-balanced mind though my ideas of a well-balanced mind differs from the ideas of a partner I once had, whose name it was Bilson. 
Bilson and me organized a strolling dramatic company, and we played the drunkard, or the fallen saved, with a real drunkard. The play didn't take particularly, and says Bilson to me, let's give him some immoral drammy. We had a large troupe unto our hands, consisting of eight tragedians and a bass drum, but I says, no, Bilson, and then I says, Bilson, you hain't got a well-balanced mind. Well, says he, yes, I have, old hossfly. He was a low cuss. Yes, I have. I have a mind, says he, that balances in any direction that the public requires. That's what I call a well-balanced mind. Yeah, I sold out and bid adieu to Bilson. He is now an outcast in the state of Vermont. The miserable man once played Hamlet. There wasn't any orchestra, and wishing to expire to slow music, he died playing on a clarionet himself, interspersed with heart-rending groans, and such is the world. Alars, alars, how I'm thankful we air to that providence which kindly allows us to live and borrow money and fail and do business. But to return to our subject, with our recent great triumphs on the Mississippi, the father of waters, and them is waters no father need feel shamed of, twig the witticism, and the cheering look of things in other places, I reckon we shan't want any Muslim of hearts. And what upon earth do the people of Concord New H want a Muslim of hearts for? Ain't you got a state house now? And what more do you want? But all this is furrin' to the purpose of this note, after all. My object in now addressing you is to give you some advice, friend Wales, about managing your wife, a business I've had over thirty years' experience in. You had a good wedding. The papers have a good deal to say about Vikings in connection therewith. Not knowin's what they air, and so I frankly tells you, my noble Lord Duke of the Throne, I can't exactly say whether we have em or not. We was both very much, uh, frustrated. But I never enjoyed myself better in my life. Doubtless your supper was ahead of iron. As regards eatin' uses, Baldinsville was allers shaky. But you can get a good meal in New York, and cheap, too. You can get half a mackerel at Delmonico's or Mr. Mason Dory's for six dollars, and biled potatoes thrown in. As I said... I manage my wife without any particular trouble. When I first commenced training her, I instituted a series of experiments, and them as didn't work, I abandoned. You better do similar. Your wife may object to getting up and building the fire in the morning, but if you commence with her at once, you may be able to overcome this prejudice. I regret to observe that I didn't commence early enough. I wouldn't have you suppose I was ever kicked out of bed. Not at all. I simply say, in regard to building fires, that I didn't commence early enough. It was a rather cold morning when I first proposed the idea to Betsy. It wasn't well received, and I found myself laying on the floor pretty sudden. I thought I'd get up and build the fire myself. Of course, now you're married, you can eat onions. I always did. And if I know my own heart, I always will. My daughter, who's going on seventeen and is frisky, says they're disgusting. And speaking of my daughter reminds me that quite a number of young men have suddenly discovered that I'm a very entertaining old feller, and they visit us frequently, especially on Sunday evenings. One young chap, a lawyer by habit, don't come as much as he did. My wife's father lives with us. His intellect totters a little, and he saves the papers containing the proceedings of our state legislator. The old gentleman likes to read out loud, and he reads Talbo well. He eats hash freely, which makes his voice clear, but as he unfortunately has to spell the most of his words, I may say he reads slow. Well, whenever this lawyer made his appearance, I would set the old man a reading the legislative reports. I kept the young lawyer up one night till uh, twelve o'clock listening to a lot of acts in regard to a drawbridge away off in the east part of the state having sent my daughter to bed at half-past eight he hadn't been there since 
and i understand he says i go round swindling the public i never attempted to reorganize my wife but once i shall never attempt again i'd been to a public dinner and had allowed myself to be betrayed into drinking several people's healths and wishing to make them as robust as possible i continued drinking their healths until my own became affected consequence was i presented myself at betsy's bedside late at night with considerable liquor concealed about my person i had somehow got procession of a horsewhip on my way home and remembering some cranky observations of mrs ward's in the morning i snapped the whip pretty lively and in a very loud voice i said betsy you need reorganizing i have come betsy i continued cracking the whip over the bed i have come to reorganize you have you parade tonight i dreamed that somebody had laid a horsewhip over me several consecutive times and when i woke up i found she had i, I ain't drank much of anything since and if i ever have another reorganizing job on my hand i shall let it out my wife is fifty-two years old and has always sustained a good character she's a good cook her mother lived to a venerable age and died while in the act of frying slapjacks for the county commissioners and may no rude hand pluck a flower from her tombstone we ain't got any picture of the old lady because she never stands for her ambrotype and therefore i can't give her likeness to the world through the medium of the illustrated papers but as she wasn't a brigadier general particularly i don't suppose they'd publish it anyhow it's best to give a woman considerable leeway but not too much a neighbor of mine mr rufus minkins was once very sick with the fever but his wife moved his bed into the dooryard while she was cleaning house i told rufus this wasn't the thing especially as it was raining violently but he said he wanted to give his wife a little leeway well, that was too much i told mrs minkins that her rufus would die if he stayed out there into the rain much longer when she said it shan't be my fault if he dies unprepared at the same time tossing him his mother's bible it was awful i stood by however and nussed him as well as i could but i was a pretty wet nurse i tell you there's various ways of managing a wife friend wales but the best and only safe way is to let her do just about as she wants to i adopted that there plan some time ago and it works like a charm remember me kindly to mrs wales and good luck to you both and as years roll by and accidents begin to happen to you among which i hope there'll be twins you will agree with me that family joys are the only ones a man can bet on with any certainty of winning it may interest you to know that i'm prospering in a pecuniary point of view i make about as much in the course of a year as a cabinet officer does and i understand my business a good deal better than some of them do respects to st george and the dragon ever be happy a ward End of chapter 13. End of the complete works of Artemus Ward, part 2, War, by Charles Farrar Brown.